go ahead and share the word with you for just a few moments tonight, and then we're going to have communion together, okay? And this is going to be a communion where I want everybody to take it, but if you're all in, take it. If you're not all in, then think about it. Because this is for believers. This is not for folks that haven't figured out whether they're all in. And when I finish talking to you in the next few minutes, I really hope that you have decided that you are all in. I'm going to talk to you tonight briefly from a subject that is so important and so powerful because this is, this is not tradition. This is the day starting last night just after the turn over into a Friday because the way they did the clock and the watches of the night and the days, a sundown was the end of a day and the beginning of a next. So Jesus, uh, torture and, and, and crucifixion, whippings, beatings, and all that began after midnight on Thursday night, but that's Friday, and continued until he gave up the ghost and breathed his last breath at 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon. So that's, that's exactly when it was. I mentioned to you a while ago, I want to serve communion to you. We want to here for everybody that's all in. I hope it's not just this season of the year, but even for me, I just love him so much. I was watching, um, I was watching, uh, a precious man that's a, a friend of the ministry, John Maxwell, he's spoken here before, great leader and leadership teacher. He was talking to a man, assuming or presuming, as most of us would, that this man kind of came from the same understanding that he did, and he was talking about the goodness of God. And the man he was talking to said to him, it was like before a seminar teaching, and the man said to him, you, you know that I'm an atheist, right? Right? And without even taking a breath, John said, don't you miss him? And the man was visibly shocked. And he said, what do you mean? He said, just what I said. Don't you miss him? We're born to love God. It's absolutely the antithesis of everything we were created to be, to say, I don't believe in God. You're in the image of God. You were created in the image of God. You were born to love God. I love him. And this weekend, is, is it would be painful if we didn't know the outcome, but we must visit the path. As I was going back through the 24 hours of his crucifixion today and realizing how many spots that those of us have visited Israel many times have been on that he was taken through on that day, I was thinking today about the high priest Caiaphas' house and about the dungeon un underneath his house that we've been in many times, and it's one of the most moving places you can go in Israel to stand in the underground cell where they held Jesus while they figured out what to do with him next. Uh, the staircase uh, of outdoor stairs that's the original to 20 centuries ago that they took him up, flogging him and beating him and carrying his cross. All, all of those places are so real in my mind now as we talk about this, but I want to take you because the day was so full of demonic activity and pain, I want to just focus on one part, and that is the last few hours on the cross and, and his actual breathing, his last breath. And I'm going to call this tonight what it is because I've looked at it, I'm going to read the passage with you together because we only want to do and say what the Scripture does and says. So we'll have it here on the screen for you, or you can look at it in your Bible or your phone. But we're going to read a passage from Matthew 27, verses 45 through 54, and I'm going to share with you the six miracles that happened during his crucifixion. Six miracles. Let's read together. Verse 45. From noon, this was on Friday, like today, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, and he filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Let me walk with you from this passage of nine scriptures the six miracles that happened in the passing of this event. Number one, midday darkness is the first of the six miracles. You know, the, the stars and the planets are very predictable. That's why we know from astronomers that next week on Monday, the 8th of April, there's going to be a solar eclipse pass over the earth, and this part of the country will see it midday for maybe more than an hour. I've got a couple things I'd like to say to you about this because I'm going to attempt, I talked with Dr. Jeff today and some things that we're writing on our next book about prophecy, and I'm going to make a statement about that over the next few days next week because I'm going to predict something. I actually dreamed it last night. I think it was a God dream, and I woke up with it so real that it was as if it was the day that was happening. And here's what I think is likely to happen. I think we need to be a voice of hope and reason and a surety for who we are and what we know and the God we serve, because I sense that there's going to be an extreme fear come over a lot of people a week from Monday, because this is not a lunar eclipse that you might sleep through. This is going to be middle of the day, the sun is going to go dark. And it's going to be weird. And it looks like it's going to pass over us midday and last for more than an hour. It's going to be weird. And with all of those who, in my opinion, mistakenly sometimes take advantage of a, a, a message like this to make it quote unquote prophetic and be a sign of Jesus coming back or the Armageddon starting or whatever. I want us to be careful to be a voice of reason. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is not an unknown, unpredictable event. We've known this was coming for years. Astronomers have this all figured out. This that will happen a week from Monday is not a miracle. It is a converging of sun and stars, and it is a blacking out of the sun, and it will be moving. And if you step outside and look at it, you're going to feel weird. But it's not a surprise. But this one was. And I'm going to tell you this. A lot of things they didn't know. They didn't know about electricity. They didn't have combustible engines. They didn't have a lot of things we have. But they were better at reading the stars than we are. They could navigate the world in a ship without anything electronic or technical. They knew the stars. This was not predictable. That's why they were so shocked. Because even though they could read the stars, at one o'clock in the afternoon, the sun went black and stayed dark for two hours while he groaned on the cross and was breathing his last breaths. Three of the four gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, say that as his final breath, he cried with a loud voice. John, and I don't think this is a, a contradiction of Scripture, John says that's the point when he said, it is finished. I think if you could put yourself at the foot of the cross and understand 
the chaos and mayhem and demonic rage that was being released throughout the region of that mountain in the dark, you would understand. John was with his mother. We don't know the location of some of the disciples, but they were really afraid. I don't blame them. I can't hold that against them. There's no way for you to understand what kind of demonic release there was from hell, believing we have just about killed the Son of God. Maybe John's the only one that could hear what he said when he cried out loud. The rest of them just said he cried out loud. We're not sure what he said. John said he said, it is finished. I don't need to do this, but I wish it had, I had it in me to do that. I don't want to be dramatic, but I want you to get that in your spirit. And I want you to imagine that loud cry that was the last breath that Jesus breathed. It, he didn't go out with a whisper. The agonizing last breath of Jesus was recognized by all the writers of the Gospels as a loud cry. One of them said, I know what he said. He said, it is finished. And ladies and gentlemen, he was not speaking about his physical body's life being finished. He was speaking about an old and burdensome covenant that no one could live up to is over. And forgiveness now comes and is available through the grace of the shed blood of the only Son of God. The fight to be righteous enough is over. The fight to be accepted is over. The fight to wonder whether or not you can be pleasing to a God who made you is over. It's finished. It's finished. That's the first miracle, midday darkness. The second one is the tearing of the temple veil. And this was impossible. Let me describe it for a moment. And if I had the time... I would bring a couple of our big guys up here that are really strong, and I would give you just a simple, maybe just a blanket, just a blanket, and let you stand opposite each other and get a good grip on the edges of that blanket, and I want to see you rip it from one end to the other. Just rip it in half. That would be a challenge, but we are told by the specifics of the making of all of the instruments of the temple that the veil in Herod's temple was very close, ironically, it was very close to the height of this ceiling. It was 35 feet high from ceiling to floor, and it was solid woven material from wool in four colors, red, blue, white, and uh, gold. And it was, uh, in most places, the weaving was more than an inch thick. Josephus says in his historic book that a double team yoke of oxen attached to either side could not have ripped it in half. We would say you could put two four-by-four four trucks in opposite directions, and they couldn't pull it in half. Too thick, too strong, too high. What force could enter the temple and grab hold of that veil? And I always like it that the Bible is so specific. Not some kind of wannabes that wanted Jesus to look like he was the real thing. So they came in there and somehow with trickery, and they were just men and put a little scaffold up and got a hold of it at the bottom. And No, no, the Bible says it ripped from the top to the bottom. 35 feet in the air, the tear began. The heavens were shaken at the last breath of Jesus, and the veil, symbolic as it was, was ripped in half because that spirit that had been held, if you were, will, in a 10 by 10 room called the most holy place, was suddenly able to escape to the streets because there's no veil keeping me back from the people I want to fill now. So the Holy Spirit of God was released to fill the atmosphere. The veil ripping from top to bottom was the second miracle of the day he died. No doubt about it. So you believe this stuff? Absolutely. That's why I get so excited. I believe every bit of it. The third miracle that day was the earthquake and splitting of the rocks. Now, the reason that this is a miracle is because we know more now than we knew then, and this was not a predictable fault line. 
This was an absolutely revulsion from the earth itself when the beautiful Son of God breathed his last breath, the earth right in the region. This wasn't an earthquake that somebody radioed in that was a thousand miles away. The epicenter was Calvary. You know why we know that? Because the, the next miracle, the earthquake and the splitting of rocks is the third one. And the opening of the graves in the area was the fourth miracle. It wasn't like something weird happened and a hundred miles away, they had a, a quake and a rock fell off of a grave. No, no, all of the tombs in the region. Why were there lots of tombs there? Because this was the holiest place in Judaism and still is. And people wanted to be buried close to be right where Messiah's foot will, will step. And so right there by where he died, the epicenter of the earthquake happens unexpectedly, no fault line, the earth just revolting at the death of, of Jesus. And then the rocks in front of all these carved out of the rock graves were broken away in the region of his cross. It wasn't a very far journey when Joseph of Arimathea took him down off the cross and carefully took him to his new tomb in which no one had ever been buried because he went to Pilate and asked, can I bury him there? And when they took Jesus, it wasn't a long walk because the graves in the region were all already open. And here's the next miracle. The location of the empty tombs was the fifth miracle because Calvary was the epicenter and the graves were close by. And the sixth miracle is that the holy people. Now, why did the Bible take the trouble to do that? Because this was not the general resurrection. One of the things we have to look forward to at the end of this era and when Jesus returns is the general resurrection from the dead. Everybody that has ever died is going to be resurrected and have their day, their time of judgment. It's what I call the big three. There are some things... And I'll teach you this as we go along, and I've already taught some of this, and lots of you have studied this, but it's a message whose time has come. Some things that teachers are sharing as prophecy is really history. It's already happened. It's not something you look forward to. And I could go through those things very specifically that some people are still looking for that have already happened, but not the big three what the Greeks called the parousia, the final return of Christ. It's listed, that word is used almost 30 times in the New Testament, the return of Christ, the general resurrection from the dead, and the judgment of all men. That's the big three, and that is yet to come. For instance, I'll just give you one, not teasing you, but I can't go into all this now. I'm not looking for a mark of the beast. Because the beast is history. Any teaching about the beast was identifying in cryptic language the Caesar called Nero, who was the crucifier of tens of thousands of Christians. He was the beast from the sea that came from Rome, through, through Rome. And let me just ask you if this makes sense. Because this is what John said. He said, in the days of that ruler... If you don't take a mark in your right hand and your your right hand and your forehead, got mixed up there. Your right hand or your forehead? <laughs> now, how many of you understand how common that language was to a Jewish audience? Because that came all the way from Leviticus. Put these words of mine as frontlets between your eyes, and as it's written on your hand. That's why they still do. They wrap their arm. The Orthodox do all of that. They have the scripture. They put the phylactery on their forehead, and they go through that, and it doesn't matter where they are. When we fly to Israel, if you're flying like all night, when the sun starts to come up, if you have Orthodox Jews on there with you, they get up, they get in the aisle, they get their, all of that out, and they start putting that on very uh, methodically, getting prepared for their morning prayers facing Jerusalem. Just a cute little thing, I have to say this to honor the humor of my late dad, because he was having some dementia a little bit, and he was always funny. He never got mean with his dementia. It was just funny. So take no offense, please. None was intended. 
but there was a really big man of stature, really big Orthodox Jewish man, all black, black hat, black, and it's like five in the morning and he's standing in the aisle and, and my dad has been like sleeping and you're there for hours and he's sitting on the aisle seat and he looks beside him and he looks up and he looks up and he looks all the way up to the, where this guy was standing about six, six with this big hat on and he's wrapping up his arm and dad said, poked him like that and said, are you in the Boy Scouts? <laughs> and my, my friend was very offended. But we got okay. So every time I think about or go to Jerusalem and watch them putting on the phylacteries, I, I think of my late dad. Are you in the Boy Scouts? The reason he asked that, I know my dad so well, he wanted to strike up a conversation because he'd been in the Boy Scouts. So he thought, maybe I got somebody here I can talk to about being in the Boy Scouts. So the writer said, except you take a mark in your forehead or your hand. Well, here's, here's some history for you. You do with it what you will. Uh, there was, because the Romans ruled over the region of Israel during the time of Christ and the first century church and before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the period from Jesus at 30 AD to 70 AD and the destruction of the temple is the most important generation prophetically that's ever been since the beginning of time. And this event we're commemorating tonight is not least among them all. We're remembering the crucifixion death of the only Son of God. So this is the law. The Romans were ruling. They tried to immerse with or emerge with and recognize as much Judaism as they could, they were there to keep peace and try to keep things from being stirred up. But they also were under mandate to make sure that Caesar was worshiped as God. It even said it on the money. The early Christians wouldn't use the Roman money because it had the bust of Caesar and said, uh, uh, no other name but Caesar is God. That's why the apostle Peter went to jail for saying there is no other name under heaven than Jesus whereby we may be saved. He was directly quoting from a Roman coin. They actually minted a special coin with a palm branch on it so that they could do business with Christians because they wouldn't use the coin that said Caesar was God. So they made a law and said, listen, because their deal was we just want a confession out of you that you believe Caesar's God and we can keep the peace. So they made a law because every marketplace, every commercial enterprise, every bank, everywhere was controlled with Roman guards uh, standing by to make sure that they kept the peace and that they kept the Jews in line. So they made a law and said, when you come to the marketplace to do your shopping, we're going to set up a little min miniature shrine and we're going to burn incense there and we're going to have a soot from the incense. And when you come in to do your shopping, we want you to turn and we want you to give us the sign and the pledge to this uh, bust of Caesar, there's no God but Caesar. And when you give us that pledge, because you're already Jewish and you understand the forehead and the right hand thing, we're going to take some of the ashes there because we heard you say Caesar is God, and we're going to put it on your forehead or your hand and you can go on in and shop. It's a little bit like going to Costco and showing your card. The problem was it was a really serious commitment. You're going to have to deny the God that you serve, and you're going to have to confess that Caesar is your God. And if you do that, we'll give you a mark. That's why I'm not rattled every time there's somebody discussing a new technology that's going to go in your credit card or on your purse or your car, or they're going to put it in your hand or somewhere. This, has, this is not a new issue. And whatever it is that gets you to confess another God than the Lord, you know, it doesn't have to be high tech. We can do that like Peter did. We can do that on our job, not take a mark at all. Aren't you one of those people that, no, no, not me, man. Hey, where's the party? We going out tonight? You know, Peter was doing stuff like to try to convince them he wasn't a follower. So he was marked. 
in that moment, right? So let's look at the miracle of this. The resurrected holy people was the sixth miracle. Resurrection from the dead was the holy people. This was not the general resurrection. That hasn't happened yet. But this was so exciting. Why? Because the power that was released when the moment came that Jesus breathed his last breath introduced resurrection authority to the earth. Because look what was affected in these six miracles. The heavens responded, the earth responded, and the underworld responded. Everything responded to the death of Jesus. The earth shook, the graves opened, and some of those old saints that had died in faith got a camp meeting touch. Woo! And Jesus went, wait, 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 get back in there for, for a little bit longer. It's not your turn yet. I love that. One of the writers said that there were up to 500 seen and witnessed in the area around Jerusalem who had formerly died who were back. You talk about a new twist on Halloween. (laughs) Baby, when grandma shows up at midnight at your door and you're like, oh my God, you won't believe who's at the door. We buried her behind that rock 10 years ago. Dad, she's on the porch. Holy people came out of the tombs. Six miracles attended to the crucifixion of Jesus that are undeniable. And I'd like to just point out something as we bring this in for a landing. That last verse I read touched my heart. When I read it, I saw something I didn't see even as I wrote these notes out. That 54th verse, I'd like to read that again because the centurion was obviously, he was a He was a worshiper of Caesar. He was a pagan, but he was moved by what he'd seen. And listen, the Romans were professionals and really adept at this. They crucified hundreds of thousands in the 40-year generation before and after the death of Jesus. They would crucify people all the way down the highways and hang them about every 20 or 30 feet on poles for miles because the the thing was intimidation. We got to keep you under our oppression and the iron boot of fear. So they killed people by crucifixion often. That part of Jesus' death was not unique, unfortunately. It was common. But look what the Roman centurion says. He was moved, but he only gets this partly right. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. You got it, but I just got to change one little thing. He wasn't was the Son of God. You think you had an issue when he was walking around in sandaled feet between here and Galilee? He not was the Son of God as never before and will forever be, he is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. Stand with me if you would. The response of all dimensions of heaven and earth and under the earth to the death of Jesus proves the reality of his identity. Now, of course, you know that we have Sunday to look forward to when he himself comes out of the grave. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was not dead for three days. The power of resurrection that visited those other tombs visited his as well. The Bible says that the the prophet David who saw this coming said, thou shalt not allow thine to see corruption. Corruption means the the, 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 the uh, disintegration that sets into a lifeless body within three days. Jesus was not lifeless and smelling after three days. He was, I believe, no more than the stone sealed the tomb. He was up and about his father's business. 
we know he made some important stops. We know that somewhere between his death on the cross and his emergence on Sunday morning, he had to visit the nether regions and talk to the big guy down there who ain't really nothing at all and say, listen, you got the keys and I want them back. What keys you talking about? I want the key to death back and hell back and the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? He's not was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. Now I hope it makes sense to you what I'm asking you to do. Take this communion tonight. If you've heard this brief message, but tracked with me over these six miracles, and if you're all in on who he is, take his communion. If you're not sure, hold up. This is for believers. Now, as opposed to what you may have been put through as a kid, or at least I was, communion time was the most terrorizing time of church. Should I go or should I stay? Should I take it or should I not? Because somehow those preachers on on communion night, their finger got four feet long, and it was always pointing right at me. If you drink this cup unworthily, every curse in this Bible is going to come on you. Whoa, I don't want that. Well, you better examine yourself. Make sure there's no sin in your heart. Wow, this is so serious. I hope there's not one there I don't know about because I'm scared. So I've told some of y'all this before. I was on the alternating plan. I was on the 50-50 plan. I did it one time, skipped the next because I figured I've got a 50% chance of being okay. I'm not going to do it every time. But I don't want to miss it every time because he said, if you don't take it, You have no part with me. You talk about the ultimate catch-22. What are you going to do? If you take it unworthily, there's no telling what's going to happen to you. You are at the least going to grow a huge wart on your nose with a big hair right in the middle of it. And at the worst, every curse in the Bible is going to be on you because you— so I'm not doing that. But if I don't do it, then I—well, look, I love Jesus. So this is one of the things that I'm so glad— that we got sorted out in our minds and understand the joy that should accompany the opportunity to take the elements of communion and remember his death and drink in his life. That's what it's about. So let me tell you something, friend. It's not really about what sins you have committed in your life and, and what you did to assuage the guilt and the condemnation and the judgment and whatever else. That's really easy to fix. You can fix that in a moment. That's called repentance. Just forgive me, Lord. And what does the Bible say say about that? He's faithful and just to forgive. So just fix that. But if you're all in and you believe he is the Son of God, then don't you miss the opportunity to remember his You know, we used to say his glorious resurrection. I finished this up tonight, and I've got to say his glorious death. My God, there were miracles happening the whole time he was on the cross. Undeniable signs. Ushers, would you help us? Worship team, would you come? Pastor Amy, would you prepare to come and join us here? And we're going to serve Holy Communion here, and it's going to be a beautiful time of worship, okay? So ushers are going to wait on you, or did you already receive it? Do you not have it? Anybody doesn't have the elements? Please raise your hand, and somebody close by usher will get it to you. Everybody has it? That's wonderful. There's a few hands right down here close, Rusty, a couple of hands here, maybe in the back. Boy, first of all, God bless you. What a great crowd tonight on Friday night, people who are serious about the things of God. So let me finish with this as we prepare to serve you this. We're going to sing a a worship song. Come right on up, folks. We're going to sing a worship a minute. Then I'm going to come back in right when the Spirit of the Lord is It's just right. And we're going to eat the bread and drink the cup. And listen, my friend, if the whole earth 
cooperated with the death of Jesus so that it had to respond. If the earth shook and the rocks quaked and the holy dead came out of the ground, then when you remember that and you relive that and you thank him for that, and you drink the cup, which is the type of his blood, which is life, then miracles are going to happen in this room tonight. Do you need a miracle? Physically, financially, mentally, relationally, you name it. Anything too big for God? This is a beautiful atmosphere. Let's worship him just a minute, and then we're going to serve you communion. Get your spirit right in the right place. And if you need a miracle from the Lord, let him know what that is and get ready to receive that. You know what you got to do on your part? Almost nothing, but everything. You got to believe. Just, just believe. It's, it's that simple. Come on, let's worship, and then we'll have communion in just a moment. Thank you, Father.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. He said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. You think of that word remember as opposed to dismember. Always remember this moment to his friends. Don't ever forget this moment, what I am doing for you. On the night that he was betrayed, he was in this room with his friends and they were eating a meal and he took the bread. He blessed it and broke it and gave to them. He said, this is my body, which was broken for you. He said, is broken for you before he even went to the cross. So as we eat this, we eat it in remembrance of him. And in like manner, he took the cup and he gave them, said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant that was shed for you for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins. This washes your sin away. So when the father sees you, he sees the blood of his only son. Father, we thank you for the remission of our sin. And as we drink this, we drink it in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name. Lord, as we hand these down, I want you to stay right in faith, and we're going to pray a prayer for, for the miraculous tonight. First of all, and this is also a miracle, but how many of you have somebody on your heart that may be family or a friend, somebody you know that really does need the Lord and you want to just, by lifting your hand, you want their name just to kind of come before the throne tonight. Would you hold up your hand? Wouldn't that be a miracle? Don't ever quit believing it's going to happen. Just softly call their name or names out right now. Just call them out. I want them named in this atmosphere before the throne of God. My God. This victorious Jesus that we remembered by cru crucifixion and resurrection and this communion cup is listening to you now because the Bible says that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. To intercede means to stand in for, to take the place of. Let him take that loved one of that friend right there, right now. Thank you, Father. Now, if you put your hand down, how many of you in this room, I'm going to pray for three or four categories as the Spirit directs. How many of you in this room would like to have prayer and believe with me because you or someone you know close to you that you love needs a physical healing miracle? in their bodies. It may be mental, it may be cancer, it may be a disease, it may be a, 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 a whatever it is physical. You know, you have a need or you know someone who does. Hold up your hand right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, look upon every hand raised right now and we believe that if you are and we believe you are the Son of God and we believe that if the earth revolted at your death 
and that the heavens and the underworld responded to your death and the dead could not stay in the graves. We believe that you're in this room tonight saving and healing and we pray a healing anointing right now over this room. No foolishness, no silliness, no carrying on, no waiting all night, just in the name that is above every name, Jesus. We speak it over every body, every body, every physical body in this room. Let healing happen, Lord, for those who are in this place. And let them report the miraculous touch of God. Let them report the touch of God. Hallelujah. 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 It may be financial, it may be business, in the kingdom, God is interested in your joy, your happiness. He's also interested in you, the, your, your dominion. God wants you to have a place, a house. He didn't promise us all a mansion, but he promised us shelter, food, sustenance. He cares for that. That's not trivial to God. There's not a single mom in this room with children that she worries about and cries, you, cry yourself to sleep that he doesn't cry with you. So I want to ask God for, for financial and business and career breakthrough and miracles tonight in Jesus' name. You may be in a place where you just need a job, or you may be in a place where you know that you've been feeling this shift coming. God has something better for you. You're not greedy. You're not being silly. You know God has more on you than you're living right now. And, and God wants to give you that. Lift your hand if that's you or you know somebody that does. Father, in Jesus' name, we lift our hands in unity right now, specifically because the blessing that came upon Abraham through Melchizedek came upon us through Christ, and it's a blessing of possession, a blessing of possession. Lord, we pray for miraculous breakthroughs, for houses, for places for people to live, for nice bedroom and a bed to sleep in and we pray for career moves in jesus name lord how could they not be raised up because the living god lives in them and the world system cannot compete with that let them be raised up in jesus name and we confer that in jesus name and we decree that in jesus name and I pray that you start saying that every day. When you get up, start your morning with that confession. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God praise right now. Heaven is responding. Heaven is responding. Heaven is responding. Hallelujah. I heard about a book, and this will be a final prayer category, and Pastor Paul is coming back to close. There's a book that, uh, that I just became aware of in the last week or so. Some of you may know about it, um, but it's called The Other Six Days. I don't know if you've heard of that book or not, but the book, the context of the book is, the content of the book is, and the premise of the book is that every one of us as kingdom believers is called to make a difference seven days a week. But the problem is there's too many of us just locked in on going to church on Sunday and we don't apply our calling, our purpose, and our career to the other six days of the week. We're not going to change the world by attending church only. We're going to change the world by moving in the things of God and the kingdom the other six days of the week. And that's, that's the burden of my heart. It really is. I'm consumed with this right now, and I'm so filled with joy about it. Because writing and launching a leader's fellowship and the mission statement we've written is sharpen your leadership skills, build strategic networks, and move the kingdom forward in the secular world by increasing influence. And it's going to be called Leaders in Fellowship, and the acronym is LIFE. And we're going to have a soft launch uh, Friday the 5th of April, and then we're going to move forward, and it's going to become a nationwide movement. It's going to start right here. And I want you to pray with us about that. 
I want you to pray with us about that because I tell you, the precious people of God, seriously, it's time, it's a message whose time has come to see the world changed. And the culture is not going to be changed with Sunday morning services. That's where we get refueled. But then we go out and change the world because the mandate on Adam is the same on us. Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and take dominion. Adam's fall didn't make God change his mind. After the flood, guess what he said when Noah came out of the ark? Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and take dominion. That's our anointing. So I want you to pray with us about that, and if the Lord touches your heart, just look up uh, on mykays.org or wherever, because this is totally in lockstep with covenant here. I, I bleed covenant. This is not a different vision, but I'm just going to pour the time that I have in this season left into this. I want to see a generation of young men and women raised up to take their place at the table of changing a culture for the good of, goodness of God. And I'm going to tell you what it comes down to, and here's what I want you to pray about. Do you have a mentality of abundance or scarcity? Because some Christians love the Lord with all their heart, but their mindset is one of scarcity. There's not enough. We're barely going to get by. Someday Jesus is going to rescue us and give us a mansion in the sky. And I didn't mean to rhyme that, but I've just got this gift. I don't know. How many of you know God's got a divine purpose on your life? Do you believe that, really? Do you believe that? It's more than your nine to five, baby. There's a divine purpose on your life. So let's get serious about the master's business. And let me tell you, I am so excited about the things I'm hearing about what's going on in the ministry here at Covenant and with your leaders and the vision that's being cast and the word that's being learned and the truth that you're standing in and the expansion that you're making. This is a world-changing spot. And I prophesy in the name of Jesus that as surely as the earth shook by the cross where Jesus died, that this place become an epicenter for kingdom change and advancement, and God use every one of us for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And he's great. Thank you, Lord. And thank you to, to Pastor Mike for just a great word and a great word and, and it's enlivening and and before we release, it was just a, a few things and you could remain standing. Just a moment ago, he asked if you were believing for someone, and we saw a lot of hands. My question for you is, what about you? There's no greater day than today to say, Lord, I'm coming back to you. There's no greater day than today to say, Lord, I need to know this God that would give up his life for me. If you're in this room, if we would just have every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're in this room on this day that represents Jesus giving of his life for us, if you're in this room and you say, Lord, I need to know you, I don't know you, but I need to know you. Or I've been away from you and I need to come back. If that's you, I want to pray for you right where you are. If you would just lift your hand and let us see it so we can thank you in Jesus' name. I see that hand. One, two, three. Come on, anybody else? Four. Come on, this is a perfect day. Five, six. Come on, seven. Come on, eight. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Nine. Come on. Thank you. Ten. Eleven. 12, 13, come on, make it count for you. It's a perfect day. 14, 15, thank you. 16, oh, we'll wait for you. 17, thank you, Jesus. There's a couple more. There's a couple more. There's 17. Come on, 18, 19, come on, 20. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, this is so great. Thank you, Jesus. 21, 22, 23, right there, yes. I promise you, I'm not lying to y'all. <laughs> this, this is great. This is so good. The heavens rejoice over one 
what's going on right now in heaven? What's going on right now? Thank you, Jesus. At Covenant Church as a family, let's pray this prayer. And if this is your first time or you're coming back to the Lord, I want you to mean this with your heart. It's not the words that save you. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But you need to hear yourself saying what this is. I want you to believe in your heart and then confess it with your mouth. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for me. I acknowledge my sin. Please forgive me. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Jesus, thank you for living for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising for me. And thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill me now. And from this day on, I am yours and you are mine. Be glorified in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on. Let's give the Lord a hand. That's awesome. Come on. That's awesome. That's what this is about. This is what this is about. Praise you, Jesus. That is so awesome. So awesome. This is the beginning of a new life. It's just the beginning. And God has great things in store for you. You know, one of the things we do as a family at church is we help each other walk through things together. We don't just leave you hanging. We walk through things together. So we want you to text SAVED to 54636. And that way you'll get a seven-day devotional to help you walk through things, uh, to teach you just the, how these next seven days will go now that you are saved. But also, if you are a family member here at Covenant Church, and, uh, and you call this place home and you um, are prepared to, to give your, your, your regular tithe and offering, we want to make sure you have an opportunity to do that. And if you're a guest and you want to participate in that, we want you to be able to do that as well. So you can do that through the QR code and, and uh, the, the receptacles and the lobbies. And there's also envelopes there. And uh, we'll pray for that when we completely release here. I just want you to know that we'll have our prayer team here at the altar as well. So if you need prayer for anything, uh, then they're here for you. As Pastor Mike prayed for miracles, we have a report. There's a lady in this room today who's been praying for her daughter. She went into a coma seven years ago. And, and the Lord told her she would wake up at 12 o'clock and she woke up at midnight. She's awake. So God is still in the healing game. He's still in the healing game. So I'm saying if you need prayer, you better get you some prayer. Amen. So our team will be up here at front, up front. And if you need anything, they'll be here to pray for you. We pray God's blessing on everything that is sown today, that it goes to his furthest good and be a blessing and it becomes fruitful. And as you go, may the Lord bless you. And may he keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may he cover you with his precious holy name, the name of Jesus. God bless you all. We'll see you this weekend.